I think this is a statement. This monkey is a, an American monkey. Think about how many people would have an, uh, a monkey from America in a Tudor court at that time. Probably no one other than the queen and the king, maybe. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast with Rebecca Larson. Catherine of Aragon is quite possibly the most underrated of the six queens of Henry VIII, frequently seen as boring and pious. Today we get a chance to look at a different side of Catherine, one we don't often talk about. To help us understand, today I am joined by Dr. Emma Cahill Moron. Emma's PhD is in art history, and her research focuses on the cultural and artistic patronage of Catherine of Aragon and the construction of the image of female power in the Tudor court. Emma, welcome to the show. Hi. I'm so excited to talk Catherine of Aragon with you today. And I want to start out because anybody who's listened to the show for any small period of time knows I really dislike historical typecasting. And one of the things that drives me crazy is that Catherine of Aragon is frequently, if not always, seen as one dimensional, and that is as a pious queen. So as someone who has done extensive research on her, how would you describe Catherine? Oh, that's a that's a very good question, because you're right. I think it is fair to say that she was a very pious woman, but there was so much more to her than that. The way I see her, because uh, influenced by my own work, is is as a patron of the arts and culture, as someone who is deeply interested in bringing new types of art and culture to the Tudor court when she she knows that she's going to become the queen, the first Renaissance queen in England. Uh, that's what she's interested in, as well as as also in her in her side of being the ambassadors of the Spanish monarchy and on advancing that alliance between the Tudor dynasty and the, and the Spanish monarchy. That's how I see it most of the time. I love that. And we we're going to touch base on all of that stuff. But one of the first things I have to ask you is, you know, you come from Spain and mm-hmm. I'm really curious, historically speaking, is Catherine as popular in Spain as she is, say, in the UK and in the U.S.? I think she is, uh, maybe for different reasons. I think one of the main reasons why she is, and not that she's not famous for this in England, but not as much. In Spain, she's very famous because she's the daughter of Isabel of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon, and they're probably the most famous monarchs in in Spanish history. Um, So I think uh, the court that she grew up in is a very famous, uh, in in our view of of Spanish history, in in, in schools, in the way we, we are taught our history. Uh, So people always find the connection more in Spain with her mom and her father than maybe with Henry VIII. But they also have, you know, read about what happened to her. And I think they also see her as a as a very devoted Spanish Catholic. Uh, There's another side of her to that uh, with the whole Reformation, counter-Reformation movement. So she's famous for several things. But I think in Spain, she's she's very famous for being the daughter of Isabel and Fernando more than uh, for being, um, you know, uh, the first wife of Henry VIII. Okay. And what kind of relationship did she have with her siblings? She, uh, obviously, there's a big gap between her eldest sister and her. Uh, Her eldest sister was born when her mother was still just a princess in a very different time and during the Civil War, the Castilian Civil War. And then Catherine is the, the youngest. She's born in 1485 when her mother is already a queen. So with her first sister, I think her her elder sister was like a motherly figure to her, too, because of the age gap. Um, She had a very close connection to her brother who gave her different gifts throughout her life. And he was going to be the next king. So I think all the girls were just really liked uh, having their brother around, too, because they all were closely connected in the court of Isabel of Castile. And then. You know, with the youngest, the two youngest, Juana, and, and especially with, with uh, Mary, who she, she was very close to in age, they just traveled around all the time together. So they grew up pretty much doing the same thing. So, but they all knew they were going to be uh, key pieces in, in foreign alliance, probably, probably because they were younger. So they also knew their destinies were different. 
I always think about how different it must be to be part of a royal family versus just commoners, right? What is it like to grow up knowing that these siblings that you have grown with, that you've matured with, now you're all going to go to separate places and maybe never see each other again? That blows my mind. Yes, I think it's part of the life of of these, uh, especially the women that were always sent to foreign alliances or to foreign, even neighboring kingdoms, but sometimes they would never see the relatives again. And and because of the increase of, of traveling in this century, in the 16th century, Catherine did see, for example, her sister Juana again, when she was traveling from the Netherlands to Spain, and they had to stop at the court of Henry VII because of a big storm that, uh, you know, <laughs> they almost died in. So, I mean, uh, but I think they were linked through the ambassadors, and, and they would always speak about the affairs going on, in, and they would write to each other because in this time these women are already writing a lot uh so i think they even though sometimes they had portraits of their siblings and other people in there catherine had many portraits of her um relatives so i think in a way you know they, they maybe they wouldn't see each other every day but yes they were in contact if that makes sense yeah and i'm glad that you brought up portraits because i've always been curious we see so many portraits of catherine as a married woman in England, what portraits are there that are confirmed her in Spain of when she was younger? Oh, that's a very controversial topic. <laughs> but there is, uh, there is at least one that uh, is labeled as possibly her with, with a question mark because it, it, it really, uh, what we know is that it was per- painted by an artist that worked for her mother, so John of Flanders, Juan of Flanders in the Spanish sources. Um, We know it's one of the daughters of Isabel because she looks very much like her mom. There's two of these portraits. One is an older uh, girl. The other one's younger. Could be the same person. What has been said is that because she's so young and because she's holding the bud of a a red rose, she could be Catherine and linked to her her marriage to Arthur Tudor. So um, in the course of my research, I found that for Catherine's um, birthday one time, this this artist was paid a, a certain amount by the treasury of the extraordinary, which means that this could have been the commission of this portrait or a portrait that went to England because in his letters to Catherine, Arthur does reference her, seeing her face. And Isabel of Castile had portraits of Henry VIII and, and other members of the, the Tudor dynasty. So, I mean, this this is probably the the, the portrait that, we could say is most probably her in her youth is a portrait of Juan of Flandes and the original is in the Tizen Bornevitsa Museum in in Madrid. Thank you. Now, now you mentioned that Isabella had a portrait of Henry VIII. Do we know, is there, does that still survive? Is it anywhere? Do we know what it looks like? Uh, It was a portrait of Henry VII and his wife, Elizabeth of York. So think about Catherine's first marriage to Arthur and those marriage negotiations. So this inventory of, of the goods of Isabel was done uh, at the beginning of the 16th century. So this was the original tours, uh, Elizabeth of York, Henry VII, and Prince Arthur. And no, we don't have, because the Alcázar of Madrid uh, had a great big fire and all, most of the royal collection was destroyed there. Uh, those portraits have not gone down um, in the Spanish royal collection to the, well, they would be in the Prada Museum today, but those, a lot of that, uh, those artworks were destroyed in the fire of the Alcázar. So that's too we don't, bad. We don't have them. Oh, those darn fires. They destroyed I know. so much. <laughs> <laughs> fires and floods. They're the, the two big ones, aren't they? Yes, yes. These these palaces burn when they burn. They they burn with like you know what happened in Notre Dame. It's just all the artworks inside, not just the building per se. You know, it's the the collection inside of those palaces, like Whitehall Palace when that was burned too. It's so crushing to think of the things that are lost. Yes, it's true. Let's talk a little bit about her genealogy, in case people aren't familiar. How and why was Catherine a good prospective wife for Arthur? What was it in her genealogy that made her a good candidate? That's very, very good question and very interesting because, I mean, in the late mid- Middle Ages, uh, Castile, especially Castile and England, had had uh, different marriage alliances and, and marriages between royal people of, of the two reign, uh, the ruling houses at each time. 
for example, uh, I'm thinking of Catherine of Lancaster, who was Queen of Castile, and she was uh, Queen Isabel's grandmother. And she was a, a very a prominent figure in Castile, and she, she was a regent, and she was of English origin. So this this dates back uh, to the, the 14th century, the 15th century, and uh, all these marriage alliances that have been established to protect basically something that was very important to both realms was the the, the, the economical and, and trade industries that they had, like the like the wool or the steel or other things that uh, Castile and England exchanged. And they also exchanged with uh, Flanders, which was also another one of these territories that was linked in this kind of like Atlantic alliance, if you would like to call it. So she was a wonderful match for the Tudors in England and it strengthened them essentially is what you're saying. Yes, because she brought in Lancaster blood. Uh, so her mother was considered for several English matches, several marriages in England too. So, I mean, it was just a part of the, when these new rulers, especially when Henry the Seventh is looking to, to, you know, make his claim that he is unifying the Yorks and the Lancasters, Catherine is perfect because she's bringing legitimate Lancastrian blood unlike his own, you know, ancestry, which was a bit more dubious mm -hmm. than in the case of Isabel of Castile. Did they have to get a papal dispensation for the marriage with Arthur? Yes, they actually did because they were closely connected by family links. So they did. Uh, and actually, there's a very beautiful genealogy uh, that was created by the Spanish ambassador for Queen Isabel just to, to prove this in the Archivo General de Simancas in the Spanish National Archive in Valladolid, where you can see how they are both connected. Um, and it's just to show that they do need that marriage dispensation, but it's really to show how closely um, Catherine was going to bring the blood of John of Gaunt, really, of the first Duke of Lancaster to, to the Tudor dynasty, which was lacking a bit of that. Mm, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. It's, they needed that extra little something yes. to make it more secure. So she well, comes... and then Isabel and Fernando are very powerful too. So it's just like perfect, you know. Right? Yeah, <laughs> they're they're the <laughs> they're the kind of people you want in your corner. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so Catherine comes to England to marry Arthur. Can you tell us anything about the journey that she made by ship? Was it just a typical one? Did anything eventful happen? Like everything in the 16th century, so is very complicated, and the, what, it wasn't an easy journey. So first, when she left Granada, when she left her mother and, and father, she went on a pilgrimage all the way to Santiago de Compostela, or the, uh, the patron saint of Spain is, is St. James. So she went on a pilgrimage, and a lot of people would have, had, have heard of that pilgrimage. Uh, and in Santiago, uh, she went all the way to La Coruña, which was the port that she was going to leave for to England. But another storm, like the one that hit her sister years later, hit the... Um, that that passageway is always very difficult to navigate. So she they had to come back into the Iberian Peninsula on a little a little uh, northern town called Laredo. I'm not far from that that town. Uh, I'm from the city of Santander, which was another port uh, important port of these northern uh, coastal um, shore of the Iberian Peninsula. And they had to wait there because Catherine was very sick, probably just you know. <laughs> thinking I'm going to die. <laughs> so uh, what happened in the end is that Henry VII decided to send someone to, to guide them to England, and that's what they did, and that's how they got to Plymouth. Um, so it was with a little bit of aid that they got there. And when they got there, they arrived at the incorrect location, right? Mm -hmm. Well, all, most uh, the majority of the ports and the big cities in England knew what they had to do, more or less. Because okay. this had been uh, prepared for a long time. So, I mean, they knew that ships could be, you know, that the, the sea was always difficult to navigate. So, but yes, um, but that wasn't an impediment because Henry just decided, well, I'm just going to go and meet her halfway there. Um, so he rode off with, with Arthur and, and they went to meet Catherine. Yeah. As somebody who has always been landlocked, I think it's hard sometimes to imagine what it's like to live on an island or to have to deal with the English Channel in those conditions. So I really appreciate when you can kind of explain a little bit what it was like. You know, obviously she probably got seasick. Yes, yes. She was probably <laughs> terrified of, of going back into that sea. Right. And thinking, is, am I, am, are we going to make it or are we just going to all die? And well, that those things could happen. And I'm sure they've heard all kinds of stories. I mean, 
I would think everybody knew about the white ship tragedy and, you know, how terrible that was. That would have to be playing in the back of your head that this could happen to me, too. Yeah. It happened many other times. I mean, the famous Spanish Armada, that was mainly what happened. It's just that that area is just very difficult to to navigate. Mm. Yeah. So once she made it to England, I'm kind of interested in knowing how did Catherine's Spanish culture influence the Tudor court upon her arrival? Oh, that's another very good question. I think we have to think of Spanish culture in terms of the the taste of, of the monarchs, because obviously Spanish culture uh, in terms of what, you know, the regular people would like was very different. But in the case of the monarchs at the time and the, the court that Catherine grew up in, they had a, a strong influence of of uh, because their family, the Trastamanas, came from the from Northern Europe. They had a strong influence of the Netherlandish art, and that wasn't something that um, and that was something that she took to England. But it was already flourishing there already because Henry the Seventh had had Flemish artists work for him. So I think there was a connection point. But what did influence her her uh, patronage afterwards was the fact that she was used to women exercising that kind of like power of 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 dealing with artists of commissioning innovative arts like portraiture like um i don't know influencing artists to come to england like i think she did with pietro torrigiano and others so even hans, hans holbein so it's just influencing the king to to go further in his netherlandish taste and do a bit more of a more innovative kind of taste that she had from Spain, you know. What about court dances? Did she introduce new dances that maybe the English hadn't known about? She introduced all types of themes and topics and dances and festivities because she she understood the festive world a bit differently. For example, the carnival became something important in England for some time when she arrives because it's not just her that arrives, it's her with a lot of people. So it's not just her culture, it's the culture of the people she brings. Um, and then, you know, uh, everybody likes to be entertained by new things. So people just enjoy these new things like the carnival or the feast of the Epiphany, which became very important. And other, and then the fashion changes a lot because she brings a lot of the influence from, you know, the Islamic fashion that became something very predominant in the court of her parents. So there's all types of little things that she influences um, and because she came from a very cos- cosmopolitan court, really. I definitely want to talk about the fashion part of it, because when I think of Catherine of Aragon, I, I think of just the, the few portraits that are you know, in the public domain that we can see. And she never seems very fashionable to the modern eye, but she really enjoyed clothing, didn't she? She did indeed, and I think uh, one of the problems with this is we always tend to think of her in the later years of her life and not in her early years of her reign when she was uh, actually just setting the fashion for the Tudor court, the new fashion. The, and, and even before that, when she, when she was preparing to go to England, her dowry was impressive, and she had dresses made from the best silks from Italy and these tailors in Madrid and, and, and these... Um, places, other places in Spain and in Italy and other places and and even from the north of of um, Europe because like I said the 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 Flemish fashion was also something that was part of Isabella's court Th- those all went with Catherine they're described wearing like um, dresses tons of jewels I mean she was used to the most lavish and and most um, uh, colorful of of fashions but it's just we tend to like think of her in the Blackfriars trial dressed in black. Uh, with an English fashion uh, of a matron queen, not of a, you know, of a young princess or young consort, you know? Yeah, exactly. I think it's interesting because Anne of Cleves, of course, came from Germany. And when we see her portrait, she is still dressed in that German fashion. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that in the English portraits of Catherine. How long did it take for her to adjust and maybe transition a bit more to the English or maybe the French fashions? Ooh, uh, I think she always kind of adapted the new fashions with what she had already felt comfortable with. I don't think that 
the biggest part was when she brought all this all the all her dowry from spain obviously because that was a change in fashion like the the they say the waist the waistcoats and the the types of the of the dresses and 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 the skirts and all that we know about all that this it, there's great work by uh, maria hayward on this but um it's just more of the also think about whether silks are coming like all this international trade is activated with the spanish alliance with italy and all these places it's it's uh it's italian fashion becomes something too that she explores and and they all explore or fashion from the islamic world it's all like a it's a spanish taste for international european fashion if you may with catherine aragon i think and depends on what kind of like image she wants to portray in some of those images that you're talking in portraits she is dressed as an english queen and in, in, in another one uh, where there's an inscription of, with her name, she doesn't have anything on her head. Uh, that she was the only one in the kingdom who who was married who could do that. The only woman to not wear anything on her head. So I mean, I think she changed more than people would think. She changed her fashion to make statements about what was going on. And speaking of what she looked like in portraits as well, one of the things that's always intrigued me was that she was painted, and for lack of a better word, with a monkey. Can you tell us <laughs> anything about that? Yes, well, I, this monkey is, has been in my mind for some years. Um, we even have a little name for him in my house. We call him Granado. There's a little um, joke. But um, yes, I think this is a statement. This monkey is a, an American monkey. Think about how many people would have an, uh, a monkey from America in a Tudor court at that time probably no one other than the queen and the king maybe and we know that uh some gifts were sent from her for her from america in 1518 like a, a big chair from the cacique women and um and the person also mentions animals and we also know that her niece in portugal was um the head of this network of of gifts uh, exotic gifts that she was sending to the european courts where her relatives were so it's very probable that catherine got this from her niece uh who was uh, the queen in the portuguese court or from one of her relatives because that's how these things worked you know the more exotic the the more status you have in in a court where those things are still so rare so yes i i have thought a lot about this monkey as you can see <laughs> <laughs> you just blew my mind though that this monkey came from america i've never heard that before yeah wow that's so cool i like that yeah yeah well, Poor monkey, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to skip past the whole Arthur and Catherine part, but I do want to kind of just touch a little bit about when, um, after their marriage, Arthur got sick. And mm -hmm. it's been said that Catherine was sick as well. Did mm -hmm. you find anything maybe in the Spanish records that give a little bit more insight to what happened? I know that she was extremely sick because Queen Elizabeth of York had uh, a special carriage sent for her. Uh, I know that her parents were extremely worried that she was still there where that sickness had been. And that, that is re recorded in the in the reports that the Spanish ambassador sends to Isabel and Fernando and the answers back. They're very worried that she's still there. And I think that speaks to the fact that it was something contagious, obviously, because it affected both of them. Uh, and she was extremely sick too. So I think it was just one of those unfortunate occasions in England where either the sweating sickness or something like that just ravages through a place where, you know, they were there with courtiers. It was a court. It was Ludo. It wasn't like the middle of nowhere. There was a lot of people there. So I think that's what the idea was that was sent to Spain was that it was something contagious. Um, and she eventually she does and, and she survives it. So she was very lucky. I bet that was another piece of her trauma later on because the, that seemed very extreme. It seems very extreme in England and something that in Castile doesn't seem as prevalent or I haven't heard about it so much. You know, of course, mm -hmm. there was plague and all those things, but not as like vicious as it seems to be in England sometimes. Mm -hmm. So after Arthur died, she was kind of in a limbo for a while. Mm -hmm. At what point did she become ambassador? To her, I think it's very clear that after Elizabeth of York dies and then her own mother dies at the end of 1504, that she's pretty much alone with uh, two kings that kind of like play around with her. And obviously she's still very loyal to her father, but she sees that unless she starts to do something for herself, 
the the negotiation is just getting dragged and she really wants to make this happen and i think she just needs to do that to not succumb to just probably the grief of losing you know her mother and still being in a foreign land without you know uh, a stable situation so she was trained to do this because she knew latin and, and she'd been close to all these people that had done this in her childhood so i think it was just like a natural step for her um, I think probably something she spoke to her mom about, you know, you are going to become a special kind of woman because you will know a language that will allow you to, you know, to be in the public sphere, really. So she started negotiating with Henry uh, very quickly and her father just accepted her role and, and sanctioned that she was the ambassador. So she was working with the other ambassador, but he was very slow. So I think she was anxious to to get the not just her marriage but other alliances with to strengthen that alliance to to help her her case and her status in the in the Tudor court she always sounds like such an intelligent and strong woman why do people describe her as pious was she any more pious than any other person in the 16th century uh probably not probably i think pre- everybody was pretty intense about their piety uh, I think she had a very, very stable piety that that it, it just became a, a, a sign of identity because of the things that happened to her and the break uh, of her marriage and what that entailed for religion in England and throughout Europe and, and how the Reformation just is, is starts really in England. It's because of her uh, decision to not cave into the you know, the whole, our marriage was never valid. So I think that's why people, it's like a contraposition between Henry as being the, you know, the starter of the Anglican church and her being the the pious Catholic that can't get over it, you know? So I think it's more of a construction, a later construction that actually, I think everyone was really pious in the 16th century, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. It was the way of life. Yes, 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 exactly. Do you have any evidence of maybe letters that she had written to her siblings when she was Queen of England? She does write when she's Princess of Wales and, and ambassador. She does write to her sister several times. She's trying she's trying to marry her sister, the Queen of Castile, Joanna, to Henry the Seventh at one point. So she does write to her several letters, and she had seen her, like I said, in fifteen oh six when Juana was in, in England. I have always been very surprised that there's no surviving letters with her uh, sister, the Queen of Portugal, who died in 1517. But I think it's just we haven't found them yet. Um, And her other sibling uh, had died before she left for England. Um, And two siblings, her brother and her other sister. So, um, yeah, I'm always surprised that we haven't found the letters between Mary, Queen of Portugal, and Catherine, Queen of England. That would be that would be great. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yes. That would be a treasure trove. Yes. <laughs> like the, the Queen Mary, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots letters that we just deciphered. Yes. See that? that was incredible. I cannot. And we actually have one of the gentlemen that was part of that coming up on an episode very Ooh, soon. Oh, exciting. Yes. I cannot wait to talk about that as, as well. So what a oh, good. yes. Good connection between the two topics here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Arthur died. Catherine was in limbo for a while. And then here comes his younger brother, Henry. Mm -hmm. It always comes off as a love story in historical fiction or Mm -hmm. on TV series. Do you have any idea what it was really like behind the scenes? Was it a love match or was it more of a political? I think it was both. I think it was something natural for both because they had, you know, because uh, they kind of grew up together in a way, you know, think about Arthur dying in 1502 and then them not married until 1509. So Henry was really a boy when he met Catherine Aragon. I think he was probably always impressed by her education, her uh, exotic, uh, imagine she spoke with an accent and knew many languages and was an ambassador. I mean, think about it. He probably just grew up fascinated by her. And she, I mean, he, he he turned out to be like a very handsome young man and he became king at 17. So I think they were ready to do it. They, they just, <laughs> yeah. So and they speak. did for, yeah. And for a long time, they were happy. Like any other Royal marriage at the time, he had his mistresses, of course, but overall he 
was always uh, showing his love for his uh, wife and supporting her through the first pregnancies when she was unlucky. So I think that's a that's a big part of of I think their their story has two parts, right? Mm. And I think we've heard so much about the second part. We need to hear more about the first part now. So much more. Yeah. Are you going to write a book? <laughs> yes, I'm trying. Uh, if, you know, life is so busy. But yes, yes, obviously, uh, I think it's important not just in their love story, but the the things they did together. Because it's not that Henry didn't do all the amazing artistic things. Is that Catherine helped him in a lot of these. Like his other wives helped him in, in other things. So I think it's just including women in the narrative. You know, it's not only Henry. It's Henry and other people. I'm always so curious about the social side of things that were going on at court. And I want to know what was Catherine, you know, we know she was interested in art. Her daughter, Mary, loved to play cards and stuff like mm -hmm. that. What was mm -hmm. Catherine into? Okay, so she was reading was one of her favorite things in studying and studying not just religious things, but also philosophy. She loved to talk to humanists about philosophy and moral behavior. Um, she was very interested in educating women, which was something very similar to her mom, but at the same time a bit different because, different because she wants all Christian women to be educated. So that's very innovative in the sense that she makes that bigger than just the court. Um, but then she was uh, into very mundane things. Like she loved um, like her Spanish food. She, she incorporated some different uh, trees and fruits and things into the English diet, at least in her, uh, in the places where she, she would get her food and um, different types of like lettuce and, and, and fruits and things like that. Or she like, for example, exotic animals or exotic, uh, all types of ob objects that would arrive. She had an interest in in looking, a, a, in, in constructing an England that was beyond the island, that was thought bigger than that, you know? So that's why she had a lot of people going to the Netherlands to get stuff for her and lots of people going to Spain all the time to, to get, you know, to, to make Henry VIII's court an international court like she had grown up in. I think that was her main interest is to 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 make that court uh you know a very uh colorful and very um a renaissance court really she wa she missed what she saw at home and she wanted to replicate it a little bit right i and, guess yeah and one of the things that she had at home that i recently read about that she brought to england or maybe it was there already maybe she popularized it you can let me know were sweet potatoes and henry the eighth loved sweet potato pie is this right <laughs> Who doesn't love sweet potatoes? I love sweet. I didn't know that, but that sounds very consistent with what I was reading recently because I'm really interested in in the whole relationship of Catherine and Mary to gardens and gardening and, and palaces as being bigger than just a palace and having like grounds where you can grow stuff. Um, so that makes total sense with what I've, I've been reading about because this is like a new avenue for me. I, I was more centered before in the artistic and cultural Right. Uh, but then from all those, all these things stem from those too, right? It's all right. culture. Food mm -hmm. is culture too. You have to learn, you have to look at the big picture in order to even understand the little parts. Yeah. Definitely. You, you need to know lots of things about specifics to look back into the big picture and not get lost because it's difficult. It is. In the case of Catherine Vargon, a lot of the information has been lost. But uh, once you get to know all these little parts and you look back, you're like, oh, this kind of starts to make sense that she was just a, a foreign queen that had a high Renaissance education and then just wanted to replicate that a little bit and help Henry to, because that made Henry happy. He was also educated to in that sort of sense of the new learning and all that, you know? Hmm. So that's that's how I see it. And how was Catherine's upbringing and background beneficial to her daughter, Mary? Was she able to bring things to Mary that maybe Elizabeth didn't have? Well, I think that the things she, uh, some things she brought to Mary, I mean, she taught her personally how to speak uh, um, Latin and and probably Spanish because th there's some Spanish grammar books in, in the palace where she grew up. But think about this, the palace where she grew up, was a palace where Edward and, and Elizabeth grew up. So, and I think um, the these women have been always put in, in uh, against each other. You don't realize that probably Elizabeth grew up thinking, well, Catherine of Aragon was a great queen. 
in many ways, not just about her. She wouldn't think just about her religion or what happened between her father and, and her. I think she just created a, a new mindset in women uh, like Mary and like Elizabeth to be like, oh, women can actually do stuff and pretty important stuff, you know? Um, so that's the, the the terms that I like to think about it because I think those, those terms haven't been you know, studied before um, very much. And they're kind of like, there's a growing trend on this now and it's good. I think it's a, it's a good trend. I think so too. This has been so much fun talking with you about, I feel like I could talk for two hours and continue asking you questions. But before we end, I really would like to know, is there anything about Catherine maybe that I didn't cover today that you want people to know about her? I think that uh, one of my uh, messages for anyone interested in Catherine Aragon is Catherine Aragon was part of a larger group of women in the Spanish monarchy that just become agents of change. Um, and it's not just her sisters, but her, all her nieces. And they just become very important women in art and culture in the 16th century, the, the century of the queen. So I think that anyone interested in Catherine of Aragon or Mary the First should also become interested in these uh, marvelous women. There's a, a cool initiative now in the Prada Museum, an itinerary. You can follow it online, too. And you can just see all the portraits and the artwork that these women, the Spanish monarchy, contributed to the royal collection. And that has created the Museo del Prado. So how cool is that? Women like Catherine of Aragon and Mary I, who is part of the itinerary because there's a portrait of her there. So it's just very cool. Very cool that they're part of a larger network of women mm. um, that are amazing in the 16th century and beyond. Emma, thank you so much for opening my eyes a little wider and showing the listeners a slightly different and far more interesting side of Catherine of Aragon today. Thank you so much. This was lovely. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.